Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to introduce our distinguished guest and a leading scholar in the field, Dr. Annabel Gallo. She's head of the Census Asia section at the British Library in London. Her main research interests are in Malay manuscripts, letters, documents, and seals, and the art of the Quran in Southeast Asia. And her most recent and, of course, important publication is Malay Seals from the Islamic World of Southeast Asia, Content or Context Catalog, published in Singapore in 2019. In 2019, she was also elected as fellow of the British Academy. She's a leading scholar of the field, and I'm so honored to host her today. Thank you very much for joining us, Annabel, and please start your presentation. Well, thank you very much indeed, Majid. And, um, and also, I should add to Johanna as well for this extremely exciting um, and wide ranging conversation, at which I have to say I feel a bit of an interloper because I have to confess absolutely outright I am not a scholar of tafsir. In fact, I know very little about tafsir. But for the past two decades, I have been working um, very, very um, focusedly on Quran manuscripts from Southeast Asia, um, particularly from an art historical perspective, through a study of the illumination and decorative elements and all aspects of the sort of graphic layout of these manuscripts. And so what I just hope in the course of our conversation today is that there might be some small insights that can be contributed to the study of tafsir from these thoughts on the codicology and um, physical um, form of Quran manuscripts from Southeast Asia. So my background is in Malay manuscripts, as you mentioned, and very much with an emphasis on the art of the Malay book. But in working on illuminated manuscripts written in Malay, in the Malay language, what I found is that all my um, all my research led me to the realization that it was that the finest um, exemplifications of illumination are found in Quran manuscripts from Southeast Asia. So this is really not surprising. Um, the Quran, as the supreme book of Islam, the way the book most revered and most honored is, um, is also the, that which is most beautified in many, many um, Muslim societies. So my, um, I'm going to share my screen now, um, if I can see. And so um, what I'll be looking at today is really um, Quran manuscripts with interlinear translations and how insights from these might, um, might have some bearing on studies of tafsir. As I mentioned, my study has been on illumination in Quran manuscripts. And what I focused on is the illuminated frames that you will find at certain junctures of Quran manuscripts, normally at the beginning of the book, sometimes at the end, and also occasionally in the middle of the book. And my particular study is very much, well, in the first instance, it focused on an architectural analysis of the frames which um, surrounded the text at those key junctures. And through this architectural and structural analysis, it became quite possible to identify a number of very distinctive regional schools of illumination in Southeast Asia. So these were located in. Aceh on the northern tip of Sumatra. Another very distinctive um, school of, of illuminated art was found in Tranganu on the east coast of the Malay Peninsula. And as, as another related school in Patani also on the east coast of the Malay Peninsula. And then another very distinctive um, style of is, um, manuscript art in areas of the Sulawesi diaspora of Bugis Makassar peoples, who in fact emigrated all over the archipelago. So you find this particular style of the Qurans in all regions. So this gives you some idea of the regions in which I've been dealing with. Now, in my um, search for illuminated Quran manuscripts, I probably handled hundreds, if not thousands of manuscripts, Islamic manuscripts from Southeast Asia. I have to confess I hardly read a single one, but I, in handling them I got a very, um, they spoke to me as books, 
as physical objects um, from their physical form, their code ecology, how they felt, how large they were, what the, their proportions, and all these um, physical aspects could often be correlated perhaps with regional origin, but also with genre. And I have to confess that in this um, overview, I looked at very few tafsir manuscripts because in general, tafsir manuscripts are not decorated. Now, here's quite a rare example. Um, so out of all the manuscripts I've looked at, I can, I've documented maybe over two, 300 illuminated Quran manuscripts, but maybe fewer than 10 illuminated tafsir manuscripts. Before so this going, is one, which, please. Before going further, so I had a question before going further in this course, I mean, illuminated tafsir manuscript. So I, I wonder, so you said about the different, let's say, schools of Quran manuscript, illuminated Quran manuscripts in that region. So I wonder, how, it, probably one may wonder how you, you can distinguish between, apart from the language, so do we have, if there, is, if there are any specifications or any specific elements by which we can determine this Quran manuscript comes from, let's say, Patani, the other from the other, Tangano, and so on and so forth? Yes, as, as simple as that, absolutely yes. Um, and I mentioned through the structural architectural analysis of the frames, you can define them. For example, in Aceh Qur'ans, the, the vertical borders are always extended upwards um, and there are arches on the three outer sides. So through, um, through descriptions and um, criteria such as that, you can define very, very, um, clearly. for example, gold is never used in Aceh Qur'an manuscripts to illuminate them, but is, a very, but is very often found in Tranganu. So you can um, draw up a series of criteria. These apply to Qur'an manuscripts because as you, as you can understand, in all aspects of the production of the Qur'an manuscripts, there's a sense of very great reverence and honor, which translates into a very um, conservative and conformist approach. People are very, from my interpretation of this, is there's a great um, concern not to innovate, not to change any aspect of how a Qur'an manuscript should look like in a particular region. So that is why the um, illuminated Quran manuscripts are very suitable for an art historical study because you see very strong um, preferences in certain regions for what a Quran manuscript should look like. Now this does not apply to other genres, for example works on fiqh or even compilations of prayers or um, works um, Kitab Maulid, um, the songs of devotion to the prophet, in none of these genres do you find um, quite so um, rigid a uh, specification that allows you to identify a regional origin. But to come back, and, and this applies even to tafsir. So tafsir are not very often illuminated, and when they are, it is not so easy to identify their regional origin. But this one, for various reasons, from, I think comes from West Sumatra. And so there, there, there's one other comment I can make on tafsir manuscripts from Southeast Asia, simply through having handled so many manuscripts um, without having had a particular interest in tafsir, but I do think that there are more tafsir manuscripts from West Sumatra, from the Minangkabau world, than from any other part of Southeast Asia, i.e. I encountered more tafsir manuscripts going through collections from West Sumatra than other areas, for example, compared to Aceh. And these tafsir were nearly all in Arabic and they were the Jalalain. So it was, they were not in Malay, um, but they were in Arabic. But that is a very in, um, impressionistic um, conclusion, which, which does need to be tested with more, um, with, you know, more, with, with more rigorous study. Anyway, so um, from having, seen these um, manuscripts, obviously I began to think about, well, what is, um, I didn't look at tafsir in particular, I was looking at Quran manuscripts, the Mus'haf, and out of these, some of them had um, interlinear translations in local Indonesian languages. 
And so, of course, I began to think about um, what a tafsir was and what a translation was. And it seems that um, even without going into it very deeply, there were um, that there was a spectrum of opinion. This, I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with this resource, extremely useful resource um, compiled by Sefer Choglu of the um, translations of the Holy Quran, which was eventually published in four volumes. Um, one volume covering 58 languages, including Southeast Asian languages, and a further three volumes, one each for Turkish, Persian, and Urdu. And it was a very valuable resource. And thanks to this, I, um, it led me to one Quran manuscript from the Malay world I wouldn't have found otherwise. But the um, interpretation of translation in this, um, from this resource is exceedingly broad. So everything is included from tafsirs to um, Qurans with interlinear translations, tafsir with interlinear translations, um, translations of just um, a few Quranic verses, um, commentaries. So everything is included under this broad category of translations, which is used in an equivalent sense to commentary at the same time. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, um, many of us, in fact, well, not just many of us, all of us who work on Islamic um, manuscripts in Southeast Asia will um, probably start with the work of Peter Riddell in Tafsir studies. And um, really, he's the doyen of um, Tafsir tradition in Malay. And even from this picture, you will all know the manuscripts which Peter has written on time and time again in the course of his um, career. Um, and a lot of attention has been play, paid to this manuscript, which um, Peter has categorized as the oldest known commentary in Malay of a part of the Quran. It's a manuscript held in Cambridge University Library, which is known to have been copied in Aceh in North Sumatra at, at around between 1600-1604. And it's a tafsir on the Surat al-Kaf. Um, and Peter has recently um, brought out a full monograph length study of this manuscript. But Peter's doctoral work, of course, was on the earliest, um, the earliest full length Malay commentary on the complete Quran, which was the work of Abdul Rauf from Aceh. It was the Tarjuman al Mustafid, and it was um, completed in the 1660s. And this is the work that Peter did for his doctoral um, dissertation. Now, Peter's definition um, of tafsir seems to be very different from the um, definition that was used in the earlier um, compilation by Sefer Choklu on translations. Peter distinguishes between translation and, and exegesis commentary. So with regard to the, um, the early Cambridge manuscript, Peter has written, um, clearly this work is much more exegesis than simple translation. And he notes that by the middle of the 17th century, the Malay world was actively producing Quran manuscripts, translations of certain verses, and at the very least exegesis at the level of surah. So he makes it quite, um, you know, quite a clear distinction. So after his work on the Tarjuman, when he discusses um, tafsir in the Malay world, um, the next full length commentary of, um, in Malay of the complete Quran occurs in the early, he identifies it as an early 20th century work produced by a scholar from Kedah in the Malay Peninsula, Muhammad Said bin Umar. So that's, and he, Peter himself acknowledges, this is a gap of 250 years. So at that point, coming from the perspective of looking at manuscripts of the Quran, I wondered what, where do Quran manuscripts with interlinear translations fit in that picture? Because in um, earlier, in the 2006, I had worked with um, Ali Akbar in Jakarta on a very important collection of um, manuscripts from the court of Banten in West Sumatra, which are now held in the National Library of Indonesia. And a number of these Qurans had interlinear translations in Malay and also in Javanese. 
And so I wondered how would these fit um, into, for example, where do they sit between Peter's quite um, rigorous and narrow definition of tafsir and a very broad definition on the other hand. And this is where um, Erfan's work comes to the fore. Um, and he has just recently published an article on this particular manuscript and another one from this collection, um, both held in the National Library of Indonesia. And Erfan absolutely regards these Qur'ans with interlinear translations as tafsir because they were produced with the clear aim of explaining the meaning of the Qur'an. So to Erfan, these are tafsir. So it's, um, I think that's a very interesting contribution to this um, consideration of where Qur'ans with interlinear translations sit in the spectrum. Uh, this is very interesting and fascinating. I, I went through the works of Peter as well as the works of uh, Irfan. I were really impressed and uh, I think both of them have something very important thing to tell us. But the thing which I think we should take into account is about the, how we want to approach the notion of tafsir. So, so my impression is if we're going to consider what Irfan says is a tafsir, so we should assume that there might be more tafsir during 200 years after Abdul Rauf until the Sayyid Umar. So there might be more tafsir if you're going to consider what Irfan considered as tafsir. And if you're going to consider Peter's definition, so probably those 200 years are going to be a blind page. So what do you think of it? Well, I mean, I think you've got it in a nutshell, Majid. That is the issue. So I suppose what I can um, do, contribute here, even though I am not analysing the tafsir myself, because I am um, compiling, um, I'm looking at all this material and pulling it together, is to say that, well, one interesting point is certainly they're going to be, if one accepts um, Erfan's definition, there are going to be more tafsir than Peter might have um, indicated at the beginning. But not that many, because the interesting thing is that there are not many Qur'ans with interlinear translations. So if you look at um, the Sefer Choklu um, compilation actually it contains all sorts of things and there are very very few mushaf with interlinear translations in there so this is my own list which only includes a few of the listings from um, the Sefer Choklu list so as you can see there are this is everything that I found in the course of 20 years um, full Quran manuscripts with interlinear Malay translations there are only three that I know of Two of them are the ones that um, Irfan has studied, which, are which were written in Banten in the form of multi-volume sets. And there is one um, single volume Mushaf, which is in the Royal Asiatic Society in London. And I will show you, I have got some pictures to show you of this. And there's also very interesting one, which might only be a single juz, that might be the final juz of the Quran from Mindanao. And this has never been studied. So um, yes, there may well be tafs Malay tafsir, which we are adding into the pot um, to fill in the gaps between Peter's two extremes of um, Abdul Rauf and um, the early 20th century. But there's not that much. Um, there are also two manuscripts with partial translations, and I'll show you that as well. For Javanese, there are only three, and Bugis Makassar, there are two which were already um, identified by Sefer Choglu, and a few in Cham and Thai, which even though it's not my um, area of the world, it's also in Southeast Asia. So this is the manuscript in the Royal Asiatic Society. It is a single volume Quran, um, and as you can see, it's got the interlinear translation in Malay, it might come from the north coast of Java. Um, it's not clear, but the name Samarang is amongst various notes scribbled on one end page. On one end page, it's not definitive proof, but it does locate it within that um, that world anyway. So that is the single volume Quran. The the one which has never been studied. Um, this is held at the West Point um, Military Academy in Virginia. It was captured by American forces from the Taraka River forts in Mindanao in 1904 
and I have only been sent a few pictures from it, which has not allowed me to identify the complete extent of the work, but it goes at least from um, the 98th surah to the end of the Quran. So my guess is that it might consist of the last um, juz of the Quran. And so the piece of work which is simply crying out to be done is an analysis of the Malay translation. Where does it come from? Is it something that is original, created in Mindanao? Or is it something that maybe derives from the Tarjuman or, um, or, or what? So we, 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 will, we will, that is a, a, you know, research to be done. Um, then there are two very interesting manuscripts, which um, are not, they were not created as, man, as Quran manuscripts with interlinear translations, but they have had some explana expl explanations added in between. This is a very old manuscript from Gorontalo, a Quran from Gorontalo, written before 1688, which is thanks to the ex libris um, on the flyleaf, it is now held in Leipzig. And you can see it's a very, in a very fine hand, very clear. And you can see that they're just, this is one page that I know of. I don't know if there are any other pages with Malay. This is interlinear Malay commentary and translate, no, not the translation. Um, take, it, take, it, take that translation to mean what you will. I don't know if there are any other Malay notes in the other part of the manuscript, this deserves to be um, studied further. And the final manuscript with Malay um, translation is a quite a well-known um, Quran, also very early. It was, comes from, again, a very remote area, the small island of Manipa, which is um, near Seram in Maluku, near Ambon. It's a manuscript which was copied before 1697. It's held in Leiden University Library. The manuscript, again, this is through work on paleography. I would say that the manuscript itself is in a local hand, but the interlinear commentary is probably in a European hand. Certainly the use of numbers, you can see in the left hand um, column, the numbers one, two, three, four for notes, that is not, uh, that is not within an, an Indonesian Malay idiom, that is um, a, a European scholarly approach to the noting. And even the, the fact that there are page numbers at the top of the page and the surah number, that is not a traditional element of Quran manuscripts in the Malay world. So in this manuscript, we, we have an interlinear translation, but I would see it as deriving from a different tradition from the ones which we may perhaps be more interested in as reflecting a local tradition. So those are all the Malay examples I know. The Javanese, there are three. One of them is in Leiden and was, um, is published by Sefer Choglu. This is one which is not included in his book. It's a very interesting manuscript from Chirabon. Um, from an art historical point of view, from the illumination, one of the most interesting things about this manuscript, as you can see, is that the illumination, the decoration is made of calligraphy. And we have three representations, representations of e, on each page of what in Javanese would be called the Machan Ali, that the, the, the lion, the tiger of uh, the lion of Ali, where um, the Shahada is. Um, depicted in the form of um, a lion. Now, everybody knows, <laughs> I mean, the question of the depiction of um, living creatures and in a religious context in Islam is a, um, is, you know, is a very, very major con um, topic of, of research and discussion, but this is the only Quran manuscript I know where there is something approaching a living creature depicted. In the decoration of the Quran, so it's interesting from the different people's patches. Do we and know then about these the are. This one? Do we know about the data? Sorry? Do we know about the data? No, it's um, it's held in Java. Um, with with Quran manuscripts from from Southeast Asia, I mean, ninety percent um are nineteenth century. So unless you have good grounds to assume that they are older, then you start. You know, the yardstick is nineteenth century. Um, so I would I would guess say mid, maybe early to mid nineteenth century, but I have not had a chance to examine this one personally myself yet. So, and so the last um, slide of um, Quran manuscripts from Southeast Asia with translations 
this is one, the top one is um, one with a chum translation from Vietnam. This has been fully digitized for the Endangered Archives project, so you can read, look at the whole manuscript online, whereas the one below has got Thai translations and it's in a private collection in Hamburg. So I'm just showing you these two, I'm not discussing them further, but just to show that, there are, that the world of um, Quranic translations in Southeast Asia is there's still so many completely unresearched areas. So now in, in the second half of our conversation, Majid, what I'd like to do is just, I've presented the material that I've gathered and just say where I think it could contribute to tafsir studies. I mean, these are just no answers, only questions and, and comments. And the first thing that struck me is really how few um, manus Quran manuscripts with interlinear translations there are from Southeast Asia. But if we go back to the source I mentioned, the World Bibliography by Sefer Choglu, we saw that there were four volumes. The first volume, which um, covered every language except for Turkish, Persian and Urdu. And the, the next three volumes, each volume was devoted to each one of those three languages. So that shows you the volume of um, tafsir, of translations, of commentaries produced in those three languages compared to other Islamic languages, meaning the languages of Muslim communities who have um, studied the Quran all over the world. And my question is whether this might um, suggest some difference of pedagogical approach in an area which maybe it maybe it's that maybe there are commonalities across the Indian Ocean between Southeast Asia and the languages and the Islamic languages of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa and also East Africa, the Swahili coast and Ethiopia, which are the other languages um, listed in the in the Sefer Choglu um, book of translations. So there are very few manuscripts with interlinear translations and commentaries in those regions compared to the Indo-Persian zone. So that's just, and of course I accept it includes Turkish as well, and that's you know, another matter because it, Turkish cannot be equated in um, scholarly traditions with Persian and Urdu. But that's, so that's just a question to be raised, simply the comment that there are so few. Within Southeast, from a Southeast Asian perspective, it is also surprising that within these very small numbers that Malay with its extraordinary reach and its association with the, with the learning of, of Islam, that there are so few Qur'ans with interlinear translations in Malay, only three compared to Javanese, which is the language of just one ethnic group, that there are also three in Javanese. So I'm also surprised that there are not more in Malay compared to Javanese and that is um, and I, to me that says something that it was not, that interlinear Qur'ans were not a feature of the Malay, um, the Malay speaking world. Um, the next, another point that I would like to um, raise um, as a direction for conversation is that in my work on um, illumination in Qur'an manuscripts, as I mentioned earlier on, um, you most Quran manuscripts in Southeast Asia are actually quite plain. Of course, you all, we always show in PowerPoint presentations the beautiful pages, but you only find these on very few pages in any Quran, usually at the beginning of the book, sometimes at the end, and then very occasionally in the middle. But my one of the most um, important findings, I think, from my work on um, illumination of Quran manuscripts is that the location of the illuminated frames in the middle of a Quran manuscript from Southeast Asia is very strictly determined by its regional origin. So that also answers your question, Majid, how can you tell where a Quran manuscript is from? And this will help you to know. So from Patani and Tranganu, for example, the east coast of the Malay, of, of the Malay Peninsula, if there is um, illumination in the middle of a Quran manuscript, it is always at the beginning of the Surat al-Isra at the beginning of the 17th surah. If the Quran is from Java or from Sulawesi, if there are illuminated pages in the middle, these are always at the beginning of Surat al-Kaf, the 18th surah. But from Aceh, the illuminated pages in the, in the middle of a Quran manuscript 
always mark the beginning of the 16th Jews, so the middle of Surat al-Kaf. Now this is very, very distinctive indeed. It reflects what must be deeply entrenched um, local preferences and tradition. So from Aceh, we have hundreds, we have documented hundreds of illuminated Quran manuscripts, more from Aceh than probably any other, of illuminated Quran manuscripts than from any other part of Southeast Asia. And in all these manuscripts, if there are illuminated in the middle, they are, um, you know, the beginning of Jews 16. But the problem is that I just mentioned also that most Quran manuscripts, um, you, and not just Quran manuscripts, manuscripts from Southeast Asia, there are very, very many without colophons, without dates, but 90% date from the 19th century. In Southeast Asia, Quran manuscripts very rarely have colophons, so we often have problems in dating them. So out of these hundreds of manuscripts from Aceh, there are none that can be dated firmly to be earlier than about 1770, 1760, nothing that can be dated firmly. And so recently I really enjoyed the conversation I had with you, Majid and Ervan and Peter, when I came across some references to manuscripts of the Tarjuman of Abdul Rauf's um, Tafsir that reflected the fact that the manuscript was created in two volumes and the volumes were divided precisely at the 16th Jews. Now, of course, as Peter said, that's on the one hand, it's quite a, a normal place to divide, um, a, you know, a, a tafsir or a commentary. And yet, and yet, as I said, we find that these, um, the, the identification of the midpoint is so strongly regionally demarcated in Southeast Asia. To me, I would like to see if there is a closer correlation between the fact that um, in manuscripts of the Tarjuman and Peter's um, base manuscript for his PhD, which is held in the National Library of Indonesia, and on the basis of the watermarks, he dated it to a very early date, to within one generation of Abdul Rauf's life, or, um, of his death, and maybe the composition of the manuscript. And another manuscript of the same work at Princeton University Library, where they both the second volume start at the, um, the beginning of June 16. I would like to know whether there is a correlation that the beginning of Jews 16 is always um, illuminated in Quran manuscripts. But if so, it's a chicken and egg question. Is, did Abdul Rauf's um, division of his tafsir reflect an entrenched tradition of how people approach the Quran in Aceh? Or was the impact and um, significance of Abdul Rauf's tarjuman so, um, so immense that it thereafter had an impact on the production of Quran manuscripts in Aceh. So that is um, a question just for consideration. And I think it could be explored with, um, in other regions of Indonesia where, or S Southeast Asia, where I have identified a preference for illuminating a different midpoint of the Quran. If we look at the preferred tafsir traditions on the east coast of Malaysia, say, or in Java and Sulawesi, to see whether a same division um, in the manuscripts occurs at that point or not. So that's just an idea of how the study of illumination can lead us into thoughts about um, regional preferences in tafsir um, um, traditions. Um, one other consideration when I look at manuscripts of the Quran is to analyze all aspects of the layout of the text and the graphic um, pre presentation. And one of these um, aspects is the surah headings, of course, which also have regional, um, regional preferences, regional characteristics. The one you can see at the top of the screen is from a Quran from Java. Um, we find that there is a paleographic um, quirk quirk, which is very associated with Java, which is a preference for multiple knotted tamarbuta. And you can see how decorative it looks in that. So when you see as many um, knotted tamarbuta as that, there's a high chance that Quran comes from Java. But you can see in the first two from Java and Aceh, the information is limited to the number of verses and the place of revelation. But at the bottom of the page, we find a Quran manuscript from Bone in Sulawesi. And in all manuscripts 
Quran manuscripts in the Sulawesi sphere, we find a real interest in numerology, the numerology of the Quran. So we don't just find the number of verses, but we find the number of the, um, of the words and the number of the letters and the order of revelation. And again, it's a, a conversation with, um, with Erfan, which, um, which is documented in his recent publication of, an, that he, of a study of um, a tafsir manuscript from Mindanao, where Erfan um, proposed that, the, that there was a link with the um, tafsir of um, Kazin, I think, he, I think it was, where also there is an emphasis on the um, statistical description of each surah, of how many um, letters and words and um, verses are held in each. So even um, formal aspects like the type of surah heading might possibly reflect um, a familiar, familiarity with a particular tafsir tradition in, in each area. And, and the first heading, this, the first surah heading is particularly for those of, from Java, right? Well, I've just chosen three examples here, one from Java, one from Aceh, and one from Sulawesi. But I also highlighted um, a, a calligraphic um, spe speciality preference of scribes from Java to use, not a, to use very elaborate notata marbuta. So just to show how you can also use every aspect of the layout of a Quran manuscript to identify its regional origin. Very but the very, but the very last um, slide I will show, and this is will end my presentation, um, is from another of the great Banten Qurans and uh, Quran manuscripts, and this one has the an interlinear Javanese translation. The Arabic Quranic text is in red, and the Javanese text is in black. Now, all over the world, when you have um, a Quran with an interlinear translation in whatever language. You will normally, you will always find that the scribe has used various different graphic um, aids to demarcate very distinctly between the two texts. So this could either be color of script, like red and black. It could be size of script, with the Quranic text much bigger and the and the translation much smaller. It could be due to style of script, you know, using something monumental like um, Thulus or Muhakkak. Um, and a different style of script for the translation. It could be um, divided with borders or with um, ruled lines or decoration, or even with orientation of script that the um, translation might be written diagonally while the Quranic text is horizontally, or even placement on within panels on the page. So there are lots of different um, uh, methods that could be used. But in every case, the aim is to set aside the holy text from the translation or the, 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 um, the, the rendering of it in another language. And usually there is a very clear sense of hierarchy that the translation has to fit around the core text, the Quranic text. But this Javanese Quran, to me, is quite exceptional. I don't think I've ever seen another Mus'haf like it in any um, other language that in this case the Arabic text is fitted to the Javanese translation. So you can see there are large spaces between the red, um, the red text in Arabic, whereas the Javanese text in black um, flows continuously. And um, I think in the, the context of um, the history of Quran manuscripts that this is rather exceptional in its presentation. So that's just, um, so I'll end on that note of ways in which people and traditions around the world have approached the rendering of the Quran into different languages, particularly in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I learned a lot and I think others enjoy your presentation. Uh, before uh, asking everyone to add a, his comments, so I have two questions. The, the, so when, when you were, telling that we have a few number of interlinear Quran manuscripts, right? In, 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 in Bahasa Malaya, I mean, in, in, let's say in Javi. So, so I just wonder when we go through 
uh, manuscripts related to Aqidah or Kalam or Tasawwuf. So we have more manuscripts, I mean, interlinear manuscripts. So I wonder what, what's the story that we have a few number of Quran. So I just wonder. It's a, that's a very interesting question, Majid, because yes, I mean, there is, there's no shortage of, of other works with interlinear translations. Um, as you say, um, it, it could be any work, so works on fiqh or works on um, Sufism. And actually, um, something that really made me think is one of my, my doctoral student, Jenny Norton Wright, is doing a PhD on the, the manuscripts which supported the studying of Arabic in Southeast Asia. So she's looking at the Arabic grammars that were used. So things like the Ajurumiya or, you know, the things which are very common, the Althea in throughout the madrasas, the Pondok Pesantren in Indonesia. And she just mentioned in passing that because we are both, she and, and her co-supervisor and Dr. Mulaika Hijas at SOAS and myself, we are all very interested in paratexts in manuscripts. And she mentioned that some of her manuscripts that she had found, they either had interlinear translations or they had marginal translations or a bit like a traditional tafsir, they would have the Arabic text followed within the text itself by a running um, commentary and translation, then, and then the Arabic text would continue. So that in these Arabic grammars, you've got, you've got three different styles of graphic presentation. And what we don't know yet is what it means. Is it significant or not? Does it reflect a regional preference? Is it a teaching style or a learning style? Or what? I think these are the areas for exploration. Yeah, right. Thank you. And uh, so given the, so you said that the, so let's say what Peter says that after the 17th century, so we have a long break until, until the early 20th century. And on the other hand, we have Erfan's ideas uh, about the interlinear contributions to I mean, the, the, the availability of tafsir in the Malay Indonesian world. So do you see any relationship between Javanese, I mean, interlinear translations and those printed versions of the Quran in Javanese translations or I mean, interlinear translations? Probably Irfan and Yuhanna can add something to this one. But because we, there are a couple of, you know, Javanese printed well Qurans, but I mean, Javanese interlinear translation. So do you see any relationship between these two? Because you said that in Javanese we have, so more than Malay. Um, of course, once you get into printing, you are in a much later period anyway. Um, so that for the Javanese, I don't know if you have anything pre 20th century um, or is everything 20th century. I, for, I, for, for Malay, you do have, um, you do have a tafsir, um, printed lithographed in Bombay in about 1870. I think it might be the Tarjuman. So you have, um, for Malay, you have printing of Tasir already in the 19th century. I'm not sure about Javanese. Um, to be honest, Majid, I can't answer that question. I don't work on Javanese. And once um, the interplay between um, printing and manuscript is certainly there because printing had an impact in the Malay world while the manuscript tradition was still strong, particularly in a Pesantren context. So you do get influences feeding back through into the manuscript tradition from the printed tradition. Um, and that would be an interesting area to explore how the graphic influences um, and the layout yeah. um, did influence each other. But um, for the Javanese tradition, I, I'm, I'm always quite wary working on Java because I don't, um, read Javanese. It's an incredibly rich um, manuscript tradition and I feel I don't know enough to comment on it. So. Thank you very much, Anna. Well, I, I really like your presentation. Your comments and feedback were really important and I'm sure that it's going to have influence on the next on, on, on further studies on textile literature in the Malay Indonesia world. So, so let's start our discussion and introduce our discussion. Okay, I'm honored to introduce and discuss Dr. Irfan Nurtawa. He is a senior lecturer in Quranic Studies and Hermeneutics at State Institute of Islamic Studies, Institute Agama Islam Negeri, Metro Lompung, Republic of Indonesia. He completed his doctoral thesis, I mean, degree in 2018 from Monash University under the supervision of 
Professor Julian Patrick Milley and Professor Peter Riddle for a research titled Jalalan Pedagogical Practice Styles of Quran and Tafsir Learning in Contemporary Indonesia. His current public publications, among others, including uh, Quranic Readings and Malay Translation in 18th Century Bantam Qurans, uh, which was published in the Indonesian Mal the Malay World in 2020, and also his uh, chapter, the Malay Tafsir in Sheikh Muhammad Said Collection in Marawi City, Philippines. Thank you very much for joining us, Erwan, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Majid. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Professor Johanna and Dr. Majid, for organizing this. And thank you, Dr. Annabel, for a very interesting talk. This is an unbelievably wonderful meeting where we can meet online and have a productive discussion together. For me personally, I'm so glad that I can learn much from many scholars' talk and conversations that I always followed on Zoom, on, on, also on YouTube. So uh, this program is definitely very wonderful and I always look forward to it in the future. Uh, just let me say something that for me, uh, Dr. Annabel uh, is one of the scholars whose publications gave a great influence on my uh, scholarship in the field of uh, Quran tradition in Southeast Asia. Um, I met Dr. Annabel for the first time uh, in 2006 in Kuala Lumpur when I was taking a wonderful three-week course on how to handle and catalog Islamic manuscripts. And Dr. Annabel was one of the main speakers at the time. Um, I really enjoyed the course especially one week course presented by Dr. Annabel. And I was so lucky then that I was able to participate in the 24th uh, Asia Suk conference on the panel of Southeast Asian Manuscript Studies in Liverpool in 2008 with the invitation of uh, Dr. Annabel as the convener. I think it was the first time I gave a public talk about the importance of the interlinear translation found in the Quran manuscript. Uh, so for that, I am very much grateful. Um, in addition to what Dr. Annabel just presented, which is very fascinating and informative, uh, it is worth mentioning that one of Dr. Annabel's major work on the study of Quran manuscript with interlinear translations was published in the 2006 article journal co-authored with uh, Dr. Ali Akbar titled The Art of Quran in Banten, Calligraphy and uh, Illuminations. Um, in this work, uh, Dr. Annabel and Dr. Ali Akbar already realized a strong tendency among the, among the scribes of the Quran with interlinear translation to signify the importance of uh, interlinear text. For example, in the identification of the Bantu Quran A54 with Japanese interlinear translation, and that the scan image were already displayed in the last slide, Dr. Annabel and Dr. Ali Akbar brilliantly note uh, in, uh, in page 138, uh, 138 the Arabic text is spaced out with gaps in such a way as to allow the longer Japanese text to run evenly. So they put uh, the word longer uh, in bracket, uh, which, which uh, signify there is something uh, important uh, in the translation text. In this publication, I think uh, Dr. Annabel and Dr. Ali Akbar already paid attention to the importance of considering a layout in Quranic manuscripts to uh, signify the importance of text other than the Arabic Quranic text and how both texts in different languages uh, correlate each other. So the scribes of Bantan Quran with interlinear translation either in Malay or in Japanese languages clearly took the interlinear translation important. Even in my identification, it is in some ways more important than the source text. Given that they, I mean the scribes, 
allocated more lines for translation text and as Dr. Annabel and Ali Akbar note, created gaps in such ways to enable the translation text which is always longer to run smoothly. Um, this has attracted me to think of the conception of uh, space allocations. So, uh, in a bilingual work like the Arabic Quran with interlinear translation in non-Arabic languages, it is important to consider the ways in which the scriber had allocated certain space for the source language, which is Arabic, and for the local languages that in many ways serve as medium for understanding the meaning of the source text. The main idea is, uh, the more space allocated for certain text, the more important the text is. So, based on this, pers based on this perspective, we can identify or categorize a manuscript that contains two texts or more by considering the describer's orientation regarding the space allocations. Therefore, certain texts that occupy more space in the manuscript, if they are not taken as the source or main text, would certainly show the same significant function as that of the main text. Even in the case of the Banten Quran, as the Dr. Annabel already highlighted in the slide, the scriber seems to have intended to highlight the existence of its translation text rather than the Quranic Arabic. So at this point, we can, we can claim that the Quran manuscript with interlinear translations, as shown in the Banten Quran, show a double function. The first being the medium for Quranic recitations, and the rest for the access point in connecting the non-Arabic speakers with the meaning of the recited Quranic verses. So as for the latter, we will open a groundbreaking area on how the Quranic manuscript with interlinear translation serve the conduct of the Quran and tafsil learning and how they uh, facilitated an access uh, to the meaning of the Quran for uh, local Muslim uh, communities. Um, Dr. Annabel Stock raised a very, very important issue uh, on to what extent a work of translation can be regarded as the work of tafsir. Um, to begin with, uh, we can look at a network of tafsir established since the 17th, uh, early 17th century Malay Indonesian world that in many ways uh, shaped the Quranic exegetical activities in the region. Then, we can certainly question how these established networks have had a great influence on the way translation tradition has developed. And then how both disciplines, I mean tafsir and translation, serve the purpose of the Islamic pedagogical practices in a given environment. Basically, um, translating the Quran can be taken as part of the interpretation activity on the grounds that the process, I mean the process of making translation, requires a good understanding of the tafsir discipline. Or at very least, it needs to hold, I mean someone needs to hold one tafsir work, or more for reference, at, at least to clarify certain words or stories found in the Quran, and of Arabic knowledge to assure the meaning in target language correspond to that in the source language. So, in this connection, uh, previous studies by Professor Peter Riddell that I already, uh, that the Dr. Annabel already mentioned as well in, in her talk, especially his PhD thesis the, in the Australian National University in 1984, concerning the main role of Tafsir al Jalalain in the composition of the first complete Malay commentary, Juman al Mustafid, is a very, very useful to consider. Um, Professor Peter Riddell confirms that the Jalal line was used by Abdul Rauf al Sinkili as the author as a single reference to compose the Tajuman while treating other tafsirs, al Baidawi, al Bagawi, al Khadin, as an addition to it. The word Tajuman itself is derived from Tajama, uh, Tajama al Kalam. I quoted this definition from the Arabic dictionary titled Al Munjid. 
in logo wal alam. So the word tarjuman itself is derived from tarjama, tarjama al kalam, which means fasarohu bilisanin akhor, fasarohu bilisanin akhor to interpret it in a different language or to interpret it in the other language. So the capability and flexibility of Tafsir al-Jalalain to play a role as a single reference in providing a brief but clear understanding of the Quranic text as found in the Tarjuman inspired other Islamic scholars in the next century, Southeast Asia, or following the 17th century Malay Indonesian world to produce other Quranic translations or commentaries. So, Yeah, this is this is the case with the Quran manuscript with interlinear translations that Dr. Annabel already highlighted in uh, in her talk. It is proven that both Malay and Javanese interlinear translations found in the Banten Qurans, they are A51 and also uh, W277, and the Quran with interlinear interlinear translation in Javanese A54 greatly referred to Tafsir al-Jalalain. So the Banten Quran, I mean the interlinear translation found in the uh, Banten Quran in Japanese and also in Malay, greatly referred to the Tafsir al-Jalalain and treated this Tafsir as a single reference and used others as a supplementary. So aside from the Banten Quran, it is also proven that Tafsir al-Jalalain enjoy its privileged status as a single reference for the composition of the Malay Tafsir kept at the library of the Minana Ulama in Marawi City in the Southern Philippines. I think that's all my comments and I hope that this could uh, rise a productive and good discussion in this wonderful talk on translation and Tafsir studies to be uh, connected uh, to the existence of the Quranic manuscripts. Thank you for having me in this very uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah. for these thought-provoking comments. Uh, Annabel, do you have any idea and comments? Please feel free to add. And please unmute your microphone. Yes, um, yes thank, thank you very much, um, Ervan, for your, Mas Ervan, for your um, really um, thought-provoking and interesting response. And I have to say that it was thanks to your comments um, that I have, um, it's made me um introduce a new criterion of thinking about interlinear qur qurans with interlinear translations as i've just said there are not many of them but what your your emphasis on the amount of space that the um that the scribe planned in advance to allow for the core text followed by the translation is an important consideration so for example in the manuscripts I presented that I listed that because there are so few of them in Malay um, most of them the, the, the three major ones the two Bantan ones and the Java one were designed as Qurans with interlinear translations they were planned as such but the one from Gorontalo interestingly enough probably wasn't it was just a mushaf of the Quran and the comments have been added um, in just in the spaces that happen to be there. So I think that's a very interesting point that when we, rather than just putting all the Qur'ans with interlinear translations together in one group, it's a good consideration to think, were they originally planned as inter Qur'ans with interlinear translations, or were in some cases interlinear translations just added to a pre-existing Qur'an? So thank you very much for that, for that point. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to join us next week, September 16, when Johanna will speak with Samuel Ross. Samuel will talk about what were the most popular Quran commentaries in Islamic history, an assessment of the manuscript record and the state of tafsir studies. And our discussion will be Ahmed Shamti. Thank you very much and hope to, hope, hope to see you next week.